want us to turn this evening, if you will, please, to Psalm number one. Very, very well known Psalm in the Word of God. There's just six verses there. Uh, we're going to read it together, and then we'll just center our thoughts and our attention upon it for a time this evening. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's Psalm number one. And it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. <clears throat> Excuse me. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Just those six verses, and as always, we trust that the Lord's blessing will be upon his word this evening for his name's sake. You know, in many ways, some of the commentators will say too, is that whenever you come to the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, in many ways, is like the, the preface of the book. It's that part of the book. If you, if you, buy, if you ever buy a book, you generally, you generally skip the preface, don't you? Sometimes you buy a book and you get straight into what the author has to say and you skip some of those other things that are there beforehand. But you know, whenever you <coughs> come to the book of Psalms, if you skip Psalm number 1, you miss what I would call the main principles of what all of the book of Psalms really is about. Those principles speak of the godly life. They speak of the ungodly life. They speak of the, the struggles of the godly. They speak of the opposition of the ungodly. And the book of Psalms is full of those things. And in many ways, Psalm 1 takes all of that and Psalm 1 bundles it all up together in these six little verses that we have before us. And it begins with a word that we often use. It's that word, blessed. There are many ways, in fact, to describe that word. Some people use that, instead of using the word blessed, they use the word happy. Happy is the man, or, or blessed is the man. But that's how the psalm begins. And whenever you read through the Bible, you can't help but see that it's a book about people. It's God's word. It's God's word to mankind. We read through the Bible. We see the works. We see the, the actions of God. We see the word of God to mankind. But the Bible is a book that's mainly about people. And friends, nowhere in the Bible does Scripture tell us that God blesses programs or God blesses promotions. Nowhere in the word of God and the Bible anywhere do we see that God blesses organizations or God even blesses denominations. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the Lord blesses individuals. People like you. People just like me. And so we can trace them right throughout the word of God. He blessed Abraham. He called him. He chose him. And he called them out of a heathen race of people. And God's favor and God's blessing was upon his life. He gave to him, of course, Isaac. Isaac was a man who also was blessed of God. Jacob came after that. Jacob was also a man that was blessed of God. And we can trace this thought right through the word. We see that Moses was a man who was blessed. We have skipped Joseph. He was a man who was blessed. We can see God's blessing upon the life of David, the young shepherd boy who was anointed to be the king of, of, of Israel, a man after God's own heart. We can see God's blessing upon people like the prophet Daniel, like the, the rebuilder, the, 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 the prophet Nehemiah. And we can trace the blessing of God, man after man, person after person. We think of the book of Ruth, the hand of God upon Ruth. It's not just men. But God chooses 
individuals. God blesses individuals. And he blesses people so that they in turn might be a blessing unto others. And friends, this evening he blesses us. And he blesses us so that we might be a blessing unto others. You know, sometimes we look at the world around us and sometimes we we think of some of the terrible things that are happening in the world around us. But folks, we have no idea tonight what this world would be like if the church wasn't here. The church prays, the church witnesses, the church seeks to win people to the Lord, the church stands for what's right. And although we look out in the world that seems to have gone in many ways crazy and turned their back upon God, if the church wasn't here, how much worse this world would be. Because God blesses individuals in order that they might be a blessing unto others. Now in this psalm, we have a picture here, as we're, we're no strangers to this psalm, we have a picture here of both the saint and the sinner. We have a picture here of, of, of the godly person and the godless person. We have a picture here of the individual who is blessed and also the individual whose life is blighted. And so let's just work our way through this for a few moments this evening. And let's look first of all at the godly. I want you to think first of all about his path. His path. The godly person's path. It's a path, first of all, that is separated from the world. It says he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. In fact, if we read the whole verse, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. You know, modern philosophy tells us to emphasize the positive. We live in days when they talk about the power of of positive thinking. We, they, talk, they say to us, if we think negative thoughts, you know, we, we fill our lives with gloom. We fill our lives with depression. And so we should always think on things that are, are positive in life. And we hear a lot about that in these days of time. But in this psalm, the Lord begins here by emphasizing the negative. Because the blessed man or the happy person is marked not by the things that he does, but he is marked by the things that he does not do. He is marked by the places to which he does not go. He is marked by the the books that he does not read. He is marked by the company that he does not keep. God begins here with the power of negative thinking. In other words, a man who would be happy or a man who would be blessed begins by avoiding certain things in life that will hinder him or her Or pull him or her down. Things that make it impossible for happiness to flourish. Because those things are poisonous to the soul and to the life. Those things are destructive. Those things are counterproductive. And so we see him here. He doesn't listen to the ungodly man. He doesn't linger with the sinful man. He doesn't laugh with or at the scornful man. We won't take the time to develop those things any further this evening. But it's the things that he does not do. The fact that he is a path that is separated from the path of the world. Now please get me right here. It doesn't mean that we cut ourselves off from people. That's not what's being said here. But it means that whilst we live in the world around us, amongst people around us that are ungodly, our lives stand out different. Our lives stand out separated. Because God has come and because God has done something inside our souls. And so we won't take the time to develop that any further. But this is a godly man's path. And it's a path of separation. If you want in contrast to that to see the path of the backslider. You will see the backslider's path in that verse as well. Because the backslider moves from walking until he's standing And then finally he's sitting down. Have you ever thought about the life of Lot? And the Bible tells us that righteous man, his soul was vexed every day with what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot separates from Abraham. He chooses the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah and he pitches towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And the next thing you read about him in the scriptures is that he's in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And then further along, you read about him again. And he's now sitting at the gate in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's sitting in the place of the council, the place of power. He's a man who, who walked. And he went from walking till stopping to standing. And finally, he's sitting amongst those that are about to be judged by God. And the Bible says his righteous soul was vexed. And yet, friends, you never read anywhere in the Bible that he did anything about that. He never made any effort to get away from that. He never made any effort to move away from the the sinfulness in which he had found himself. And we're not going to take the time to develop that this evening either. But it's a path of separation. And then we see the path also of the backslider. He's walking, he's standing, he's sitting down. I wonder tonight what your life shows. I wonder where you are in your walk with the Lord tonight. I wonder what your path, if you're saved, I wonder what perhaps your path is like this evening. Are you separated from the world? Are you slowing down with the world? Or could it be that there's someone here tonight and in your spiritual walk, you're now sitting in the world. Coldness has come into your heart and you're away from the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of a path are you on this evening? But we don't just see this man's path. Because next we see the godly man's pleasure. He is satisfied with the word. The word of God has has captured his affection. That's what verse 2 says. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. You see, the godly person, the saint, has a, a different counselor from the ungodly man. He is different company than the sinful man has. He has a different cause than the scornful man has. His first love is for the word, the living word of God. And that word has claimed his attention. It says here, in his law doth he meditate day and night. Did you know tonight that what you delight in is what will direct your life? That's what will motivate. That's what will drive. That's what will direct your life. And so we need to be so careful about what we enjoy. The godly man enjoys the blessings of God. And his path and his pleasure are such that God directs his life and God makes him a blessing unto others. And of course a life that's filled like this leads a person to what we see next in verse 3. Because there we have the godly man's prosperity. He is situated by the waters. It's a symbolism of scripture. Water for cleansing represents the word of God. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26 it says, Christ loved the church. Christ gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Water can symbolize the washing of the Word of God. The Word of God has a powerful cleansing effect upon the heart and life. In Psalm 119, the psalmist could say, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. If you want your way cleansed, you need to obey the Word of God. If you want your life to be cleaned up, then you need to get into the Word and see what the Word of God has to say. And friends, praise God tonight. His Word tells of a Savior. A Savior whose love for us is such that He laid down His life for us. He shed His blood for us so that we could be forgiven for our sin. And the Word of God simply says, if you want to be clean, then repent of that sin. Be converted and trust in this Savior who loved us and gave himself for us at the cross of Calvary. You see, tonight, praise God, if you obey the word of God, your life and your heart and your soul will be cleansed, hallelujah, from all sin. And so in this psalm, the godly man, he is beside the rivers of water. Waters to cleanse the word of God. But then there's also waters to drink. And symbolically, that speaks of the course of the Holy Spirit. 
If any man thirsts, Jesus said, let him come unto me and drink. In John 7, verses 38 and 39. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Waters to drink, the Holy Spirit. And so in this picture, we see the, the godly man whose way is being cleansed, and we see the godly man who has the power of the Holy Spirit within to help him in life's toils, to help him in life's struggles, to see him through the difficulties in life and so on. He's like a tree. Friends, that's his prominence. He's like a tree planted. That's his permanence. He is by the rivers of water. That's his position. He brings forth fruit. That's his productivity. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. That's his prosperity. What a picture this is of a life that's solid, a life that's steadfast, a life that's stable, a life that's producing for the honor and for the glory of God. You know, we think about grass. Grass is mown, harvest after harvest, but the tree stands firm. We think about drought. Whenever severe drought comes, grass gets burnt up. It turns brown. But the tree beside the waters, no doubt, no drought, I beg your pardon, can destroy it or can cause it to wither. That's a position of the godly man. Is it any wonder that the psalmist calls this man blessed? Is it any wonder that this is a, indeed a happy man? Bless his holy name. God's hand is upon him. You know, friends, what we're thinking about here, the word cries out for. This is exactly what the world wants. The world needs satisfaction. The world needs something that's permanent. The world needs something that's sure. The world needs something that will not fail them. The world needs something that will not let them down. The world needs something that will be there to help them when the difficulty time, difficult times of drought and famine come. The world cries out for this sort of thing. But this man is happy. This man is blessed. Because this can only be found in the Lord. These things can only be experienced if you are blessed of God. Can I ask you tonight, is this your life? Are you blessed in this way? Where do you stand in the context of what this scripture speaks to us? Or how does your life compare to the pictures that we see here before us in these verses this evening? Warren Wearsby says, the Lord wants to bless people. And then he goes on and he says, but if we want blessing, we need to be separated from the world we need to be saturated with the word and we need to be situated by the waters. That's how he summarizes those three little verses. Three conditions for the blessing of the Lord. And the man or the woman, the young person who follows these principles will be blessed and filled with a peace and with a joy, with a happiness and with a bliss that the world knows absolutely nothing about. Can I ask what about you this evening? Could you be someone who's sitting in this gathering and you don't experience this? You know nothing of what we're talking about? Or can I ask, is this your experience in life this evening? Because, dear ones, praise God, it can be by trusting in the Lord. And so we see the godly man. He has a path. He has a pleasure. And praise God, he has a prosperity. But then look for a moment at the picture that's presented to us in the next three verses very, very quickly. Because there we have the picture of the godless man. This is a person who leaves the Lord out of his or her life. You know, by definition, a man is either married or unmarried. A man is either happy or unhappy. A man is either thankful or unthankful. A man is either saved or unsaved. 
A man is either godly or ungodly. A man is either alive or dead. And everything in this psalm sets the ungodly in stark contrast to the godly man that we have just looked at. You see, verse 4 continues and it says, The ungodly are not so. After giving us this tremendous picture of the life that's blessed of God, the psalm turns direction completely. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. First of all, we see the ungodly is a person who is driven. In contrast to the the towering tree whose roots are strong and deep and secure, deep in the soil, nourished by the perennial stream. In contrast to the stability of that, the ungodly, he says, is like the chaff which the wind blows away. The unsaved man, the unsaved woman, the unsaved young person is at the mercy of the elements, so to speak. At the mercy of forces that he cannot or she cannot see and which he or she cannot control. He's like a vessel, engines broken, steering shattered, and it's simply caught in the grip of the gale. And it's being driven, driven on and on and on to disaster. You see, such are the forces at work in the life of the unsaved. The person is not the master of his or her own soul. The person is not the captain of his or her own destiny. But he is being relentlessly driven as powerless as the chaff is before the wind. Maybe that's how someone here is this evening. Maybe that's how your life is. And try as you have perhaps done, you have found yourself powerless and unable to turn Parlous are unable to stand against some of the things that are beating upon your life because the ungodly is driven. The next verse says the ungodly is doomed. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The sinner has no standing on the day of judgment. He will be summoned to the great white throne. There to find that heaven and earth have fled away. Everything familiar will be completely gone. Everything he has sought to build, everything that he has invested his time and his energy and his talents in, it's all gone. He has nowhere to stand. That person built his life upon something that was temporary, something the Bible says that was fading away built his life upon the shifting sands of time, and the judgment has swept it all away. Verse 5 says he's doomed. He's doomed. And then finally we come to verse 6. And in verse 6 it shows that not only is he doomed, but friends, he's damned. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The way of the ungodly shall perish. Verse 6 here speaks about two ways. And there are only two ways. And this evening, there is the way of the cross. There is a way that leads past Calvary and, praise God, leads on to glory. It's called the way of the cross. And there's also the way of the curse, where you turn your back upon the Lord and you continue upon that broad way that leads to disaster, leads to destruction, and leads to damnation. The broad way, of course, we know is the popular way. And it leads to a lost eternity. And there are many people traveling to that destination tonight. Some of them will get a rude awakening because they have no idea what ends or what end they come to as they travel down that road. By nature and by practice, our feet are on the broad way. But the prophet Isaiah says, we have turned every one to our own way. But this evening, praise God, we have a Savior who is the way, who leads us on to life, who leads us on to life eternal. Because as we've said earlier, he has shed his precious blood 
so that every sin that you or I have ever committed can be cleansed, can be made clean, so that he can come and touch the life, that the life can be cleansed by the word of God, that the life can be filled with the spirit of God, that the life can be kept by the power of God to take us on that way through Jesus Christ that leads us heavenward and homeward. And tonight, can I just simply say, if there's anyone in this gathering and you're on that broad way, that way that leads away from God, and I'm not talking about being a religious person. I'm not talking about being an upright person. I'm asking you tonight, have you come to the cross of Calvary? I'm asking you tonight, have you turned, called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and put your faith and your trust in him? Can I say tonight, if there's anyone and you haven't done that, you can make that turn tonight. You can trust him here this evening. And you can pass from a life that's godless, that will end in doom and destruction, onto a life that's filled with the fullness and the blessing and the power of Almighty God that will take you heavenward and will take you homeward if you will turn onto Jesus, this wonderful Savior who laid down his life, dear friend, listen to me, just for you. Have you turned to him? Can you look back tonight to a time in your experience when you have trusted him? In a personal way? Or is there still perhaps someone here this evening and you don't know this wonderful Savior who wants to flood your life and bring you in to the blessing of Almighty God that will hold you secure for time and for eternity? Will you just turn to him tonight? Will you just take him at his word? And will you pass tonight from death onto life and be numbered with the godly, blessed for time, and praise God, blessed for all of eternity. Will you come tonight? Will you trust him? Let's just bow in prayer. Blessed Savior. Blessed Savior. It's a psalm of contrasts. Tremendous contrast. What blessing the Lord wants to pour upon us when we trust in Him. And yet what blessings we forsake whenever we choose to go on in our own way. And again tonight, let me ask you, is there someone here perhaps and you're prepared to put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? You need to call upon him. And we want to just give opportunity for that now. As you consider your condition tonight. All we're simply asking you to do is just where you sit in your seat. In your heart just reach out to him. Ask him for forgiveness. Thank him for what he has done for you. At the cross of Calvary. And by faith, just cast your all upon his mercy and upon his love and upon the sacrifice that he made with his own precious blood so that you could be saved. Just ask him to save you. We're going to pray in just a moment, but I'm going to allow just a moment or two opportunity. If God's speaking to your heart now, I would encourage you to turn on to him even right now in these moments of time, while the opportunity is there, just turn to him now and trust him. And Lord, as you look upon us tonight, you know every single life that's here this evening. Nobody skips your gaze, Lord. Nobody slips away from the eye of the Almighty. Lord, your word declares that the eye of the Lord is in every place, beholding the evil 
and the good. And tonight as you look upon us, Lord, we're either blessed or we're not blessed. And if there's any in our gathering now, Lord, who are in that category of being unblessed, we pray that you will speak to them. We pray that you will draw them. We thank you for your loving heart. We thank you for the the opportunity of salvation and the great cost that you have paid. And Lord, tonight we pray that you will draw precious souls unto yourself. Bless those that are yours tonight, Lord. May their lives be exactly of what we've read in these verses together. May there be a sense of your stability and a sense of your blessing and your security and a sense of your joy and a sense of all of those good things that you long to place within the life. We pray that each one who's yours tonight will experience those things not just today, but in the days that lie ahead. But again, Lord, we pray, should there be one in this place tonight who doesn't know you, will you save, Lord? And will you draw onto yourself now? In Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Praise God.